Here we're going to introduce the idea of a paratechnic phase diagram, in particular the binary system four strike quartz. And in the process, we're going to illustrate a uh, process called incongruent melting. So incongruent melting. And the example of incongruent melting we're going to look at is the case for enstatite, which, which we can write as MgSiO3, or sometimes we prefer to have twice the amount, and we'll write it as Mg2Si2O6. So uh, to introduce this idea of incongruent melting, let's look at the opposite case of congruent melting. So what does it mean to be congruent? Uh, so for congruent melting, that means that we have a solid that melts to a composition that is the same as the solid. So let's have uh, forced right, Mg2SiO4. If we take forced right and heat it up to higher and higher temperatures, at some point we'll reach a temperature of 1890 degrees centigrade. And at that temperature, everything above that temperature, we will have liquid, everything below will be solid. So this is a case of congruent melting. It's a very sharp melting point because we have a pure substance, uh, forced rate. And at 1890, if we have a solid, when that solid hits that point, we can continue to add heat, but any heat that we add, any heat that's added to the system, will only go into breaking up the solid and converting it to a liquid, not to increasing the temperature. So the temperature will remain fixed until all of the solid is consumed. And when it is, then we will have liquid any further heat that we use, that we add to the system will just cause that liquid to get hotter. We can do the same thing with quartz. So let's take uh, quartz. Uh, we can heat it up to a temperature of 1713 degrees centigrade. Below that temperature is solid, above it is liquid. There's another case of congruent melting. It, the liquid starts, uh, excuse me, the solid starts out as a composition of SiO2 and the liquid that we get is also SiO2. And again, uh, just to emphasize the point of congruent melting, the solid started as Mg2SiO4, and as we start creating liquid, we also get a liquid that is equal to Mg2SiO4. So now that we understand congruent melting, let's take a look at incongruent melting and see what happens. What if we have a system that looks something like this, where we have forced right over here, and uh, quartz over here, and we connect the two, we make mixtures of the two, we know that this forced right will melt at 1890, and this fellow will melt at 1713. What if we look at this kind of reaction here, where Mg2SiO4, or forced right, reacts with quartz, SiO2, uh, to give us enstatite? And in this case, we can take 2 times MgSiO3, or we could just write it as Mg2Si2O6 if we like. Uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, we get the same kind of effect when we start melting it. So how about this fellow here, enstatite? So enstatite uh, is the sum of one mole of forsterite and one mole of quartz. Now, if you plot this on a molar basis, it means that enstatite should plot somewhere here close to the middle. We usually plot these on a weight percent basis. We've got a lot more stuff over here. Forstrite weighs a lot more than quartz. So if we take one mole of forstrite and one mole of quartz, the weight percent of uh, forstrite is going to be much heavier. And so you usually see a diagram with enstatite over here somewhere. Uh, and so that's the way we'll draw it and when we consider the melting case of enstatite. So what happens when we heat up enstatite? Well, something really interesting happens, and it happens at a temperature of 1557 degrees centigrade. Well, all these temperatures are in degrees centigrade, by the way. So what happened with enstatite? I would imagine it must have shocked the early experimenters, is that if we melt enstatite, you'd think, well, you'd get a liquid that's made of the same composition, and we can just continue uh, working our way upwards. Well, that's not what happens. We will create liquid, but the liquid will be over here, much more quartz-rich in composition. We will also create a new solid we will, we will create forced right that didn't exist before. So this is kind of a fascinating thing. Take crystals of enstatite. So let's say this is a crystal of enstatite. 
uh, put it uh, in a capsule where we can heat it. So we'll put it on a burner and we'll add heat as we heat up that uh, mineral of uh, enstatite, then we will create a new mineral. It will break up into something that will be consist of olivine. So we'll just let that little green part be olivine. And then we'll also have some liquid over here. So we'll just put some liquid in red. So this is kind of diagrammatic. So the whole thing is supposed to be an enstatite. Uh, crystal, but it's going to break up. Here it has not completely broken up, so in black here we've got a little bit of enstatite left, but it's it's creating a liquid and an olivine. Not very artfully drawn here, but that's the basic idea. So we have some liquid uh, sitting over here and olivine uh, sitting off to the left over uh, also at 1557 degrees centigrade. This should be a, a perfectly uh, horizontal line, by the way, so that's all happening at constant temperature. So this enstatite will be heated up, and as it heats up, it's going to break up into this liquid and crystalline uh, parts. And as it does so, it'll sit there as we add heat to the system. So we'll take heat and increase the heat into the system. The temperature will remain fixed until all of the enstatite is gone. When all of the enstatite is gone, we now have these new crystals of forstrite that we created as a part of this melting process, and these silica-rich liquids here. Now, these liquids, they're more silica-rich. They are not made of quartz. It's not SiO2. It's a liquid composition that's really a mixture of quartz and uh, this stuff over here. So it's, it's not enstatite, it's not quartz, it's not forstrite. It's something that has a composition between enstatite and quartz. Then we've got some olivine as well. So if we want to complete melting, we have to increase the temperature further. And so you will, we will have a curve that'll connect. Let's see if we can do it. Eh, not too bad. That should be a nice smooth curve. That's about the best, the best I can do with this pen. But we will increase the temperature until we reach this temperature here. Uh, what's happening as we increase the temperature further? Well. Everything above this curve is liquid. Uh, everything below that liquidous curve here is going to be a mixture of forsterite uh, plus liquid. And so what we're doing is we're going to melt this forsterite here. And it, that forsterite that's, melt, that, that's melting, those liquids are going to be absorbed by this liquid here. So this liquid will become more and more forsterite rich. And once that liquid finally reaches the bulk composition of enstatite, that's the point at which the last little bit of forsterite crystals that we created will now be consumed. And now that bulk composition matches our enstatite. We now have a liquid that looks exactly like enstatite. We started out with a liquid that had this composition here. Uh, excuse, we started with a crystal that had this composition here. Now we have a liquid that has this composition but the path we took to get, to get there was not direct. So this is an example of incongruent melting. We'll just abbreviate that, incongruent with INC. Uh, the path we took to get there gave us an initial liquid and a whole suite of liquids along that path that were very different from this initial bulk composition. And it gave us some solids over here that are also very different from that bulk composition. Eventually, we get to something that is liquid and is equal to MgSiO3, uh, but that path was uh, very indirect, very incongruent, we would say, using that uh, geometrical uh, language analogy. So that's what we mean by incongruent melting. We'll look at the details of the geometry of the phase relationships using a much more precise diagram than anything I can draw in. We'll do that in the, another video.